Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Tourism and Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul where I send my Twitch livestream audience to their preferred destination providing that they pay with the in-stream currency struts which they earn by watching. However, in this particular video we are not going to be sending anybody anywhere. It is all resupplies because the main challenge of this series is logistics. And so here we are at Mir around the moon. Mir is in a polar orbit around the moon here and we are deorbiting a spent supply vessel that is an HTV that already has all of its FUBAR and oxygen depleted. We remain at Tanegashima as our launch site and I continued to use the launch system that I developed in the previous video which has 16 of the H2's SRBs, the boosters, plus 8 of the core engines, the LE7 engines. It's sort of a makeshift Japanese SLS using existing Japanese engines and SRBs to sort of be an SLS system and I think I call it Nisemono which means imitation or fake. It is a fake SLS uh, though in some ways maybe better than the SLS who knows. Uh, anyway there go the 16 boosters. I think the fact that it has 16 SRBs probably makes it worse in that respect. Uh, and off go the fairings and the core stage with its 8 LE7 engines is done and off that goes and we have four of the LE5 engines that are the upper stage engines for the H2 rocket so the equivalent of four RL10s same sort of idea our trajectory ended up a little bit weird so I coasted to apoapsis and then relit the engines here now this particular model of the LE5 engine had multiple ignitions I do, I'm not sure the real one does I, I have to check that but anyway this model did so I used it and we took advantage of it and here we are transferring over to the moon and it has enough delta V and there is the end of our burn so supplies on their way there's obviously a polar orbit but but even though it's going into a polar orbit around the moon already it's sort of in the wrong phase the wrong longitude of ascending node they would say and so we need we will need to change the longitude of ascending node and we do awkward burns like this to capture around the moon to sort of help the situation out and their rel relative inclination is fixed but we still need to bring the orbit down after making the further corrections but ultimately we do get to Mir not with a whole lot of extra fuel you'll notice only 63 meters per second left but it will be enough to dock of course and so here we are approaching the docking port we originally had three different stations around the moon. We had Lunar Gateway, Mir, and an Almaz station, but we disposed of the Almaz station, so now we have two. But considering that most of the viewers have moved on from the moon thing and are now aiming for other planets, it might be best to cut it down to one, uh, just so we don't have to resupply these quite so often. We'll have to see about that as I check on the supply situation there. I decide ultimately that we should just send a huge amount of supplies to Mars because at Mars most of the people are at the Phobos station at the moment and so it's easy to supply them with a huge supply vessel and so that is what I aim to send on of course the monument rocket. The stage, the transfer stage is powered by nine Raptor vacuum engines. The supply probe itself is powered by a single Raptor vacuum engine so we aren't doing the Attila thruster thing with it, but still a substantial mass and fitting for the monument rocket as we see here. Uh, those tanks to the left, by the way, are not modeled by me. Uh, those were uh, purchased models, but the rest of it, of course, is modeled by me. And here we go. Unfortunately, it is a nighttime launch of the monument rocket. This is the old computer, so the frame rate is very, very slow. Uh, it is a struggle to launch this, but now, of course, things have improved. Looks like one of the launch clamps is over, or two of the launch clamps were overheating right there. But anyway, off it goes. Very, very slowly. I mean, not really slowly. It doesn't have a horrible thrust weight ratio, it's just that the frame rate is like that. Usually, when I launch the monument rocket, it's because somebody brought it up, otherwise, I don't voluntarily do this but if somebody brings it up during the stream I get to blame them for it <laughs> so uh, for the very very long 
launch, but, you know, it is also convenient long term because we're sending such a large volume of supplies that we won't need to resupply the station as often. So here we see the booster set. I dropped the UI there to get a look at the so-called raise asterisk. And uh, we had a little bit of a fairing staging issue that was non-critical when we had the first stage separation. Uh, it did not actually decouple the second stage from the payload, so it's all right. And we made orbit. Well, we're short of orbit because I wanted to make sure to deorbit the monument second stage. And we separate the fairings at the same time because I decided that it would be prudent to carry the fairings up all the way to near orbit because they might otherwise collide with the rock if they're so big. And we let just one of the Raptor vacuum engines on the transfer stage in order to complete orbit. So all that other stuff got deorbited. And then all nine Raptor vacuum engines for the transfer. And that is what we have here. They are running on methane and oxygen. At some point I added hypothetical hydrogen and oxygen configurations for the Raptor engines and in subsequent videos I might forget that and accidentally have the hydrogen and oxygen Raptors on board without realizing that they are configured that way. Anyway, but that'll be for later. Uh, next up I decided to go with a backup supply vessel just in case something happened with the really really big one, you know, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And so I decided to launch it on a Vulcan. I put two of the RD-57 engines on the upper stage just to make sure that the transfer occurred faster, otherwise it was like 14 minutes. I also made the tank a little bit bigger uh, so that we could carry the heavier payload. So we're trying to get a fair amount over to Mars with this supply vessel as well. And we are launching the Vulcan rocket from Cape Canaveral. Uh, if only ULA made this Vulcan instead. Maybe with like AR-1 engines on the booster, like each booster could have four AR-1 engines. They, they run kerosene and oxygen and could be a sort of replacement uh, per chamber for the RD-170. And maybe RS-68's on the core? I should make that rocket. Uh, I need a AR-1 engine, but of course nobody knows what one looks like, I think. I haven't seen a photo of it anyway. Off go the fairings. So that would be a real ULA Vulcan rocket. Anyway, and we, uh, we do bring the core to orbit, and that's sad, but anyway, forgot to make sure that that was remaining suborbital. Anyway, off it goes, and here is the transfer burn to Mars. Not the best transfer opportunity for Mars, taking 4,300 meters per second there, more than 4,300 meters per second. Uh, other windows to Mars usually take less. But anyway, we do what we can here, and the payload completes the burn very, very slowly. You can see with the inflatable heat shield, so we're going to aero capture this around Mars, not use the engines, but with the inflatable heat shield it does give room for little engines at the bottom there. Uh, so that's nice as long as they don't actually bake the inflatable heat shield. But then the inflatable heat shield should be fairly heat tolerant considering it's being used to enter the atmosphere with. Anyway, next up I use a completely different rocket for another supply vessel. And in this case we have another abomination. We have the EUS on top of an expendable uh, Starship tank, not the full Starship. And this is the old model of the Super Heavy and Starship. In fact, those are KK Launcher's Raptor engines instead of my own. Uh, so we've got the KK Launcher's Raptor engines, ma mainly because I already had it sub-assembled. And we've got a six Raptor vacuum upper stage. We'll just call it upper stage rather than call it any sort of Starship. And then the US. So I think somebody must have put me up to this because I definitely wouldn't want to do it on my own account. Uh, yeah, I think this was coaxed by somebody or another. Alright, here's the Raptor vacuums. So we had a little bit of an issue with staging of the interstage. I think uh, we uh, staged the tank, the first stage tank, instead of the interstage at one point. Anyway, but again, not critical. And here go the RL10s, the four of them. 
and this burn took a while. There's the transfer burn over to Mars, so it's all Mars supplies because we, we've got a lot of people around Mars, so once there's an opportunity we have to send as much as we can. One reason I wanted to send as much as possible is so that we could focus on the far-flung missions, the missions to Saturn and Uranus, which haven't been getting as much progress because we were stuck constantly sending more supplies each window. If we can get a huge chunk over at one time, that would be best. But with these aero capture vessels, they're going to need some help uh, getting to where we're going, especially this one, which we had to do a lot of correction burns for because the EUS took so long to do the burn. I should, probably should have done that burn in two goes, but this is a uh, mid-course adjustment right there, but it was pretty hefty. It doesn't have too much delta V left to get to Phobos or anything uh, after it captures. Of course, the aero capture is not going to take much fuel, but compared to the correction this had to make, this large supply vessel launched by the monument only had like three meters per second to do. Uh, the little one, it's not actually that little, but that little one had a lot more. So we're checking in on Dyla Root and Mr. Doobie. They're getting close to Saturn, but not quite there yet. But we have to make sure that the water recycling is working properly. So that's why I was there. For some reason, we got a electric charge warning on Skylab 2. So I had to turn back to it. It was pointed in the right direction. A precision rotation had it pointed at the sun, but somehow it lost electric charge. I don't know how. Anyway, so focused on that. We have now ISS running out of food, water, and oxygen, but now we have the entry of the last supply vessel that we launched. That one is arriving first, and I decided to make sure to do a quick save because I didn't know what altitude to bring it in at, so the, well, we are going to have to load that quick save, let me put it that way. Uh, so yeah, here goes the inflatable heat shield, very good, and of course bring in the solar panels. But yeah, as it turns out, we did not pick the right periapsis for this. Uh, it did not manage to capture, so I had to load the quick save. Unfortunately, when I attempted to load the quick save, it, the game decided to crash. So that was the end of that stream because I didn't have enough time to reload after that. Uh, with the new computer, the loading takes less, so I might have been able to reload and get back to it. The uh, loading time for KSP, by the way, is dependent on the CPU, uh, just for you to know. But anyway, with that, that, that is how the streams ended for that weekend. And with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.